Hey guys, my name is Minas and today I'm going to be talking about the embryological development of the pharyngeal clefts and the pharyngeal pouches. I have a previous video where I speak about the pharyngeal arches and I recommend that you watch that video before you watch this one because it'll help you understand the concepts that I go over in this video much more clearly. As usual, I'm going to break down the concept into such a simple way so that even if you're a beginner to embryology and you have no idea what's going on, I promise that you will know what's going on and what the pharyngeal clefts and the arches become by the end of this video. As usual, let's begin at the beginning where we have a ball of cells called the blastula, which is the result of the fusion of an egg and a sperm moving down the uterine tubes. And once they go into the uterine cavity in a normal situation and they implant onto the uterine wall, a process of gastrulation will form the three germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And you've probably seen this hamburger in your textbooks, or you've seen someone play with Play-Doh in a lab and try and teach you what they mean and have no idea what they're talking about. But essentially, this is an oversimplification for this. So, in blue we have ectoderm, in red we have mesoderm, in, in green we have endoderm. This is a flat disc. You were flat to begin with. When you were stuck to the uterine wall, you were a pancake with an outer layer called the ectoderm, an a middle layer called the mesoderm, and an inner layer called the endoderm. So essentially, this this is a cross-section of when you were flat on your on the uterine cavity when you're on your mom's uterine cavity like this this is what you were if I cut it like this and have a look okay the ectoderm this is important to know becomes skin and the nervous system in red we have the mesoderm where you have paraxial mesoderm intermediate mesoderm and lateral plate mesoderm these become most of your internal organs. In green, we have endoderm, which becomes the gastrointestinal tract, essentially. So what happens is this folds, and the outer layer will become your true outer layer, the, the middle layer will become your true middle layer, and then the endoderm will become a circle, and essentially your gut. That's an oversimplification, but it's very important to understand how that works. Okay. Now this is the point at which you need to know what the pharyngeal arches are. So I'm assuming you've watched my previous video on the pharyngeal arches. And we're now we're going to talk about the development of the pharyngeal clefts and the pouches. So we have an uh, embryo right here with its cephalic or head portion at the bottom here and its tail or the caudal bit here. And we have the gill looking thing which is the pharyngeal arches. And we've drawn a black dotted line to cut it. So we're going to cut it here and look this way. And we're going to have this. This is the top. This is the bottom. That's the spinal cord. And in blue, we have the pharyngeal clefts. So each dip is cleft one, cleft two, cleft three, cleft, cleft four. In red are the pharyngeal arches. It's all the tissue in the middle. And this lining in the middle in green are the pouches. Pouch 1, pouch 2, pouch 3, pouch 4. So there are four pairs of pharyngeal pouches. The fifth one is rudimentary, which means it will evaporate and become nothing. And the epithelium of the pouches become important structures. So that's why it's important to understand how it happens. So let's start with pouch 1. <clears throat> To break it down very simply, only focus on pouch one where I'm pointing. Step one, step two, step three. So the first pharyngeal pouch will become a diverticulum that looks like a stalk and it will push against the first pharyngeal cleft and it'll help to become the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. So this right here is gonna be your eardrum it becomes a tympanic cavity and it also becomes the inner ear tube, the eustachian tube. So notice how this forms a diverticulum over here in orange and then over here 
until it sort of looks like more of a of a narrow tube that's all it becomes tympanic membrane middle ear cavity inner ear tube good a good way to remember that pouches are on the middle or on the inside and that the clefts are on the outside is that pharyngeal cleft C for cliff cliff face is on the outside or C for covering <clears throat> a covering is on the outside and a good way to know that the pouch is on the inner side <clears throat> or in the middle bit or in the inside is that a kangaroo has a pouch and the joey goes on the inside in the pouch so P for pouch kangaroos have a pouch inside and of course as an Australian I have made a kangaroo anecdote for you to help remember embryology <coughs> excuse me so now let's talk about the second pharyngeal pouch pouch two one step one step two step three this is the easiest pouch to remember it becomes only one thing it becomes a tonsil specifically the palatine tonsil so what happens is that the inner lining or the epithelium of the second pharyngeal pouch proliferates invades surrounding mesenchyme and it becomes the palatine tonsil additionally surrounding mesoderm infiltrates this mesenchyme too and helps to contribute to the structure so we can say that pouch 2 helps to form the palatine tonsil rather than it being solely responsible for its creation and in about in between the third to fifth month of development lymphatic tissue will invade the tonsil and will as a result help to form its tissue serving the, as the immune system okay so in summary pouch one tympanic membrane eardrum middle ear cavity th and internal ear canal that's it pouch two palatine tonsil that's it now pouch three step one step two step three you'll notice that the third pouch has two parts or wings a dorsal and a ventral wing the dorsal wing becomes the inferior parathyroid gland the ventral wing becomes the thymus you'll notice how it's elongating and moving cordially or down so what happens is that the thymus gradually moves inferiorly and medially until it is until it reaches its final location posterior to the ster sternum this bit this ventral wing will move down and fuse with its counterpart from the other side and reside in its final location as it moves down it pulls down the inferior parathyroid gland with it so it's coming down moving in this direction and this th ventral uh, wing will fuse with the other side of the ventral wing to form the thymus and the parathyroid gland will also detach and will eventually fuse on the back of the thymus in uh, sorry thyroid in most cases you'll notice that it has a lot of migration to, to do and that's why the location of the inferior parathyroid gland is much more variable variable than the superior parathyroid gland <clears throat> okay again patch three <coughs> becomes the inferior parathyroid gland and the thymus that's it okay pouch four step one step two step three pouch four becomes two things too the dorsal part becomes the superior parathyroid gland the ventral part becomes the ultimobranchial body don't let that big word scare you ultimobranchial body and it becomes a very simple thing but first why is the superior parathyroid gland initially inferior to the inferior parathyroid gland doesn't make sense it's because it migrates less 
the inferior parathyroid gland is pulled down with the thymus that's migrating. And so its final position will be inferior to the superior parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland, the superior ones, also detach from the wall and will have its final position on the dorsal surface of the thyroid. Now, the ultimobranchial body becomes a very simple thing. It's essentially the C-cells of the thyroid. The C-cells are also known as the parafollicular cells of the thyroid and they release calcitonin. And what calcitonin does in the body is that it detects, well, when there are high levels of calcium in the body, it regulates its level by turning down the amount of calcium in the blood. So essentially, calcitonin calcitones it down. So if you want a quick way to remember that, is that high calcium in the blood means C cells release calcitonin to calcitone it down of the calcium. So you have less calcium in the blood. Okay, quick summary. Pouch one, tympanic cavity, auditory tube, tympanic membrane. Pouch two, palatine tonsil. Pouch 3, inferior parathyroid gland and thymus. Pouch 4, superior parathyroid glands and parafollicular cells of the thyroid. That's it. That's all you need to know with the pouches. The clefts are much easier to talk about because it essentially only becomes one thing. Although we start off with all of the clefts present, only one remain in this final structure. In week five, you'll have all of them, but only the first pharyngeal cleft will contribute to anything. And what it contributes to is that it becomes, if you notice here, how the second, third, and fourth are gone, and you only have one, it becomes the external auditory canal, E-tube, and the outer bit of the tympanic membrane. So you remember how we spoke about how the pharyngeal pouch joins the pharyngeal cleft where it joins that's your eardrum that's the tympanic membrane and the good way to remember that is literally that's your ear it's the best way to remember it is to think about it as the first pharyngeal pouch and first pharyngeal cleft as the tubes of the ear <clears throat> okay so what happens over here in the second where the second pharyngeal arch is Notice how it proliferates and grows inferiorly, caudally, down. It grows until it completely covers the second, third and fourth cleft and it should obliterate it. Initially, you might have a cervical sinus remaining, but that again will not be present at birth. It won't be present in a normal situation in you sitting where you are watching this video. Again, what happens? Second pharyngeal arch proliferates, covers the second, pharyn second, third, and fourth pharyngeal clefts, obliterating them eventually. And so that's why we only have the first pharyngeal cleft becoming something. In an abnormal situation, this process where it completely joins the inferior bit of this tissue doesn't happen and it stays open. When that happens, is called a brachial fistula. And this fistula is most commonly found at the angle of the jaw anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So right here, we have the sternocleidomastoid muscle. In front of it, you might have this fistula or an abnormal opening connecting two epithelial uh, compartments. And at birth, it won't be present, but as the child grows, it'll get larger and larger and become symptomatic until it becomes noticeable. And so what happens in that situation is that this process isn't complete. So that this doesn't happen or this continues on. Another abnormal thing that could happen, or it could still be normal, but it's a normal variant, is that you have ectopic uh, parathyroid tissue where the parathyroid tissue doesn't actually join the dorsal surface or behind the thyroid. It could join anywhere from the top of your neck all the way down. It's very variable. Thymic tissue can also be very variable. Its tail could also remain attached to a bit of the thyroid. 
And that's about all that we're gonna speak about in this video. I hope you've understood everything. If you don't understood anything or if you want more information, put a comment below, I'll reply to it. Or send a message or post on the Facebook page and uh, I'll give you more information if you need it. Don't forget to follow the Facebook page if you want to keep up to date with videos, make requests for videos. This one was requested by quite a few people. And <clears throat> my next two videos are going to be on the development of the tongue and the development of the thyroid. Okay, so thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.